get started on our great webinar today. Um, we are recording this webinar, so um, we will be able to share that as an online resource after today's session. But first, I want to welcome you all. Thank you so much for joining us for our national webinar on physical activity and diabetes prevention in the COVID-19 landscape. My name is Joseph, and I'm excited to represent CSH today as a host and moderator of a great discussion with some wonderful guest speakers with us today. So today's session is the first of three major activities throughout the fall and upcoming winter and spring focusing on diabetes prevention. We hope that if you enjoy today's discussion on diabetes prevention, that you'll maybe want to dig deeper into our future discussions, first starting with our learning collaborative in January through March of next year. Applications for that collaborative are open now, and I will touch um, on that at the end of today's webinar and provide you with a link of how to stay involved. But again, today, first, we're focusing in on physical activity and a little bit about CSH before we begin. Corporation for Supportive Housing's mission is to advance solutions that use housing and services as a platform to improve the lives of the most vulnerable individuals, to maximize public and private resources, and to build healthy communities. CSH is also a technical assistance provider through the Health Resources and Services Administration and provides practical and entrepreneurial strategies for health centers to improve healthcare access, housing stability, and outcomes for patients experiencing homelessness. So we hope that if you're interested, you'll learn more by visiting CSH.org, where there are um, a plethora of, of resources available for you to check out. So again, my name is Joseph Kinkle, and I work with the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. But the council, um, at the council, I work in tandem with CSH on issues of health and housing. So I've got my CSH hat on today, and I'm speaking from that perspective. Um, our guest speakers that have joined us today are Sandra Arevalo Valencia from Montefiore Nyack Hospital, Carol Lemus from Lantern Community Services, and Leone Calderon from Wavete. And so we're so thankful to our guest speakers for setting aside the time to join us today. Our structure today will focus mainly on our guest speakers, uh, making sure that we have enough time to hear from their various perspectives um, on, on physical activity and how to promote health in their communities. First, we'll hear from the health center perspective, then the homeless and housing um, perspective, and then we'll finish with the community partner perspective. Following all three of these presentations, we will have a Q&A period. Um, so we hope that you will participate and um, we wanna make sure that you're getting out of today what you'd like to get out of. So um, please, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please uh, insert them into the chat in the Q&A features, which are at the bottom right hand of your WebEx screen. Our learning objectives today are first to increase the knowledge of approaches to encouraging physical activity for diabetes prevention in populations experiencing housing instability, to increase knowledge of how COVID-19 has impacted these efforts, and to explore ways of navigating the unique challenges of the pandemic. And finally, to consider the roles of all three healthcare providers, housing providers, and community partners in diabetes prevention and promoting health in our communities, especially given the context of COVID-19. So with that, I'm gonna lay about five minutes worth of just foundation for our conversation today before turning it over to our guest speakers. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about diabetes and the barriers to prevention faced in this special and vulnerable population of folks experiencing homelessness and housing instability. So data from uh, 2019 studies um, from the CDC and comparing data with um, health center population data suggests that type two diabetes occurs about as frequently in this special and vulnerable population as it does in the general population at uh, hovering around 9%. But in the health center world, um, this translates to over 97,000 individuals that were served with type two diabetes in 2019. 
In terms of the number of diagnoses, type 2 diabetes is beat out only by the conditions of obesity and hypertension, which hover around 200,000 each. Um, but this is a really interesting trio of top conditions in this population, um, given the known interconnectedness between the three. Um, it's extremely important to, to understand and to realize that obesity and hypertension are their own risk factors for type 2 diabetes, um, suggesting that um, those that are at risk for type 2 diabetes and those that are pre-diabetic are a um, significant, um, significantly higher number represented in this list. And that uh, really hits home the point that we need to set our prevention efforts center stage uh, as far as service providers that are um, focused on this special and vulnerable population. So a little bit about prevention and the barriers to prevention. The CDC's National Diabetes Prevention Program is one that some of you on the call might be familiar with, but it's an example of a, um, a roadmap and a, a great resource to uh, utilize when informing our prevention efforts. So the DPP is a concerted national effort to make diabetes prevention a priority in the U.S. healthcare landscape. It's a structured lifestyle change program that focuses in on uh, nutrition and physical activity. Um, just as far as physical activity is concerned, the recommendation right now is to increase exercise to at least 150 minutes per week. And you can really, um, you can really dig deep into the resources that are provided on CDC's website, and they're really helpful. Um, however, though the resources on this program are extremely valuable, um, this is not a program um, that necessarily t puts center stage the considerations of those experiencing homelessness and housing instability, um, which we consider something that we, we really need as service providers in this special and vulnerable population. We need to set center stage um, the challenges faced and the social determinants of health that are faced by this uh, person's experiencing homelessness. Um, COVID-19 also brings its own complications to this conversation, limiting already scarce accessible opportunities for exercise, limiting safe public transportation, and really shifting a lot of effort um, that might have been placed on diabetes towards infectious disease. So I mentioned the social determinants of health. Some of you on the call today are likely familiar with the social determinants, but if you're not, these are the conditions in a person's environment an experience which influence health outcomes and risk factors. So those providing services to this special and vulnerable population, especially over the past decade or more, have become increasingly aware that programs focused in Stand by. Joseph, I believe we lost you. Sorry, y'all. Yes, can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay, my phone disconnected, but I will continue off where I was. Um, so, so the social determinants of health um, are something that have really come center stage in the past decade or more. Um, and we realize that addressing these social determinants are key to improving health outcomes, and especially in terms of diabetes. These that I have listed, listed on the screen are some particular determinants where we really must continue to make progress nationally if we hope to um, ensure that diabetes prevention is person-centered and culturally appropriate for the, uh, this special and vulnerable population. Those I'll just li uh, qu quickly list off are um, housing, making sure that um, we're offering low housing, low, um, low barrier housing, healthcare access, ensuring that proper screening A1C testing and care for hypertension and obesity are available, um, taking into consideration the time, space, and resources that are, are available to those in this population. And finally, food and nutrition, making sure that fresh food um, and uh, programs involving food and nutrition are taking into consideration what is, a cult what is culturally appropriate and what is available to those um, communities.
in our cities and in our towns. So just to wrap up this um, stage setting here, uh, given the unique barriers and social determinants in this population of those experiencing housing instability, uh, we know that a diabetes prevention effort will have to involve various key players in the community. We can't really uh, expect to make a giant impact if we're siloed in our efforts. So we need to take into consideration different perspectives and different experts in our communities, including health centers, housing providers, and community organizations and partners who um, have a voice across various populations, especially at the neighborhood level. And by um, really taking into consideration each of these voices, we can make sure that our interventions are person-centered and uh, culturally appropriate. So with that, I will wrap up this portion and give the stage over to our three expert speakers. First, starting with Sandra, who is in New York. How are you, Sandra? Let me unmute myself first, I'm fine, thank you. And thank you for a nice introduction. No problem, thank you. Okay, so let's get it started. Um, and just to talk a little bit from the homeless side, but also not just the homeless, but a lot of people face economic hardship, especially now during COVID where, you know, you've lost your job and people are having a hard time just in general. Um, I remember, you know, when I, was counseling my patients pretty often every time we spoke about exercise, physical activity, the first bulb that lights in your head is a gym. Everybody thinks of a gym. And unfortunately, you know, sometimes you are in the possession that if you think gym, you think fee. And you have to decide between the fee or the food. And then it's, it's not a good perspective to tell people, you know, you have to exercise, join a gym when the circumstances just don't allow for that. So as a registered dietitian, often working with people with economic hardships, we have to start thinking out of the box and out of the box a lot. And here is something that once happened to me. I was talking to this 18 year old and I said, you know what, you don't need to join a gym or anything like that. She lives in a building, seventh floor. I said, if you can go up seven floors every day, you know, you do all the exercise that you need for a day. Unfortunately, she uh, shared with me that in the building that she was living, you know, it was public housing. There were drug dealers there that used to hang out on the streets. So her mother, uh, not on the streets, on the stairs. Well, in the streets as well, I guess. But she told me her mother will not let her take the stairs ever because of the presence of these dealers. So again, you have to think even more outside the box and you think that, well, maybe something as simple as taking the stairs is actually not possible for a lot of people. So uh, what I would like to share with you today is different ways on how we can start thinking outside the box without having to tell people to spend money on physical activity. But let's review first, why is it important that people exercise? So it's very well known, and you've possibly known all of this already, it helps you control your weight. So people are going to be, you know, looking for physical activity because they need to lose weight others because they have heart disease and they need to exercise the heart muscles um, to help with, with this condition. If you have diabetes, that's what we're talking about today. So if you have free diabetes, you need to exercise in order to prevent diabetes. But then even if you get the diabetes, exercise helps you level or even lower your blood sugars and increase your insulin levels. So that's a good thing for diabetes as well. It helps to reduce some risks of cancer. It strengthens your bones and muscles. It reduces your risk of falls because it helps with balance and coordination. It helps improve your sleep. So a lot of people, you know, especially when you have a lot of problems, 
they suffer from insomnia, and doing a little bit of exercise and a little bit of walking can help with that even better than medications, whatever they are. Improves your mental health and your mood, mood, improves your sexual health, helps you quit the smoking. So different benefits that sometimes we don't even think about. So this is just, again, thinking outside the box. I was thinking, okay, what can we do every season? Because here is another challenge. We can tell people, yes, you can go outside and walk. Well, if you're in New York and everything is full of snow and ice, it's not as easy. So what can we do in the winter? The winter is coming. So maybe cleaning the snow, building a snowman, making a snow angels. Even if you're an adult, I'm one that loves just making a snow angel. Snowball fights, cleaning the car from the snow as well, decorating your house. Then the spring comes and it's a little nicer outside. So here are some free activities that you can do. Hiking, biking, walking, gardening, cleaning, egg hunting, maybe all month long in April. And then in the summer, you know, there are some uh, public beaches that you can go to. You can go to a public swimming pool and swim, cutting grass, walking at the beach, building a sand castle, playing a sports, playing tag. Yes, we are adults, but most adults have children as well. Or, you know, we can just uh, be a little uh, silly for half an hour every day and just try to play a game and exercise. Then during the fall, there is breaking leaves. Halloween hunts, apple picking or pumpkin picking, playing in the playground with children, or just simply playing a sports or playing ball. Like there are so many things that we can actually do. Now, these are a lot of outdoor activities. So, yes, uh, but what can we do indoors? So, if you have a baby, you know, you don't need to buy weights or anything like that. Your baby can be your weight. Also, you can use like um, cans of vegetables or even the pounds of grains, like if you have a pound of beans at home or something like that, you can use those as weight. You can create an obstacle course at home or start taking the stairs, the squatting, walking in a mall is always free, climbing a stairs, dancing, fidgeting, you know, doing handstands, even if you don't do them well, just trying helps you burn a lot of calories. Um, yoga, stretching, sit down and stand up. Now, people might say, well, I don't know any yoga or I don't know how to stretch. But, you know, YouTube is the best teacher nowadays and everybody has a smartphone. So if you have a smartphone, you can show you know, people how to look for yoga videos and you can just follow like a yoga trainer online. It's always free and you can just start doing it that way. As I always say, it doesn't matter if you don't do it perfectly well, it's just the fact that you're moving and you're trying. Um, now, more to do outdoors, walking, jogging, running, climbing, biking, climbing trees. You know, these are all things that we can always just do at a park, do for free. So there are many different things. What can we do as families? You know, because one thing is like, yes, I can do this by myself, but when you have children, you have to entertain your children as well. So as families, you know, you can go to a playground, and what I usually see is that you go to a playground, the kids are playing and the parents are sitting somewhere in the corner just looking at their phone. That's not the idea. The idea is to play as a family and, you know, like walk around the kids, move around while the kids are, are in the swing or something like that, or just like, you know, swinging the kids, are, at least you're moving. So that's, that's what we want. Hop is touching, playing tag, baseball, sports, hiking, walking, waiting rocks even, like moving rocks from one side to the other. That's something that we can all do, or swimming, as I was saying. But we can also do some exercises in the house. So something that I used to tell my patients a lot is like just to start vacuuming and cleaning and cleaning windows. You know, as long as you're moving, you don't need to be outside. You, you know, if it's snowing and it's a bad day, you don't want to be outside. You want to be indoors just to start cleaning, organizing closets, sweeping, cleaning.
cleaning ceilings and fans, organizing cabinets and, draw and drawers, or just painting a wall. You know, like paint doesn't cost that much. Your house is going to look a lot better, and you're exercising, dusting, or scrubbing. Pots or pans, or the floors, or the shower, everything is about movement. There are some active jobs that also provide some uh, calorie burning and exercise. So, for example, when my patients are there and they say, oh, well, but, you know, I don't have a job and I don't like exercising, then I always say, like, you got to look for something active then because if you look for a desk job, that's not going to help you. So we have a list here of active jobs that people can do. Like, and, and some of these you can just do for some extra money, like, Washing cars or cleaning windows, for example, that like you could offer just to to help your neighbors or help somebody, you know, to do these kind of activities like packing, lifting, and carrying laundry bags or doing bags at the supermarket. Like people can just go there and say, "Hey, help! Let me help you. I just need to exercise, you know." And maybe for a tip, you can make some money and at the same time uh, do some exercise. Calisthenics, as we know, might be difficult for some people, but then again, it's, it's about just moving. You don't have to do it perfectly well. Like, a lot of people are like, oh, no, I cannot do a push-up. Well, even if you do a quarter of a push-up, will be good. So this is just like a list of things that you can do. And, you know, if you find this list helpful, I would like for you to just, uh, hopefully, I don't know if these presentations are going to be available, but. If you could just use this as handouts and just give it to people and say, listen, here, just circle a few of these that you would like to do, that you would like to try, and just follow up on those, on those uh, goals for people. What's very important is to keep the motivation going. Sometimes people are not ready to exercise. We can tell them 10 times, like, you need to exercise, 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 but, you know, it comes through one ear and through the other goes out. So there are different ways how we can help motivate people to exercise. One of them is making everyday activities more active. As I was saying, so taking the elevator, take the stairs. This is something that you can start doing on a regular basis. Or body with somebody who also needs to exercise. There are people who don't like to be outside by themselves or don't like to go to a gym by themselves, you know. So having somebody to go with is, is better for them. So finding a body to exercise will motivate them. Um, I know a lot of people that say, you know what, I don't do it, but my neighbor is really good at it. So I made with my neighbor and they, you know, he calls me every day. He's like, hey, are you ready? Let's go. No, don't say no to me. I'm waiting for you outside your door. You know, so something like that helps. Keeping a log helps because it helps you realize how much you're doing. So if you go like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I did it, and Thursday, you don't feel like doing it, you know. You probably don't want to have a blank there in that box and be like, oh, but I've been doing it so well, you know, I'm going to just do it for 10 minutes today. Who knows? You end up think you just start thinking 10 minutes, you end up doing an hour because maybe you start having fun with that. So keeping a log provides some incentives and encouragement. Right. Adding some fun, like dancing, for example, like if people like to dance to loud music and all of that and find that fun, that's a way to exercise. Don't do something that is not fun for you is what I always tell my patients because when it's not fun, it just gets boring. You don't want to do it and you're not motivated. So always find something that gives you fun and makes you smile. Challenge yourself because if you, if you just uh, – do stay with the now and the negatives and don't challenge yourself is not going to be much, much, enough encouragement for you to exercise. And start slowly. This one is very, very important because some people just uh, want to run a whole marathon the first day. And, of course, the next day they're going to be all sore and their muscles hurt and they are like, exercise will never be the same for me again. So that's why you have to start to slowly. Like if you've never exercised, start with 10 minutes a day, then 15, 20, 25, you know, and gradually 
increase your time or your intensity as tolerated. Because if you want to start this way and you kill yourself the first day, you know, you're probably going to kill your motivation as well. Now, during these COVID times, we're adding challenges, challenges to the exercise. So it's very important to remember that if you're outdoors, you need to keep your mask on and try to keep six feet apart from people around you. Especially, it doesn't matter if you're outdoors, you know, keep your mask on, keep six feet apart, avoid uh, large crowds, and try to eat foods rich in vitamin D and zinc because it helps to boost your immune system. Make sure you wash your hands before and after every exercise and every time you go outdoors. And something that I recommend is that you carry hand sanitizer with you. That way if you touch any surfaces or something like that, you know, you have your hand sanitizer available and you can be sanitizing your hands regularly. Please take a shower after exercising and this doesn't have anything to do with sweating is the fact that you've been outdoors and, and, and COVID can be everywhere, so it's best, you know, for your own for your own safety to take a shower after being outdoors. Be sure to keep hydrated. Wear a headband, you know, if you sweat a lot, wear a headband. Um, and as I was saying, bring a hand sanitizer with you. So these are all the ideas that I have. I hope that some of these are useful for you and for the people that, that you treat day to day and that you can share some of these ideas with them. I don't know if we're going to do questions right now or we're going to hold for questions at the end, but thank you for your attention. I do have a period after all the speakers um, have their presentations, so we will move on to Carol right now, but um, again to all of our Folks listening in, please feel free to participate by typing any questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom right hand of your screen. So without further ado, here's Carol. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Carol Lemus. I'm the Director of Health and Wellness at Landry Community Services. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about our diabetes programming because we have a different approach than many places in terms of how we address diabetes. We have a large population who are diabetic, um, so and even larger who are pre-diabetic. So we work around primarily prevention. Um, our mission, Atlantic Community Services, is to champion the independence and well-being of New Yorkers who are impacted by and threatened with homelessness. So how do we do that? We do that with a housing first philosophy, meaning that that is first and foremost, um, before we can provide any services, we have to provide a roof over people's heads. Uh, we work with a harm reduction approach. So we're at, we meet people where they are and work with them to reduce the consequences of whatever behaviors they are involved with. We have 16 supportive housing buildings located in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Manhattan, and we serve approximately a thousand people um, in those buildings. Uh, the populations we serve are, are people who have HIV, people who have mental health disorders, and youth coming out of the foster care system. We also have opened up within the past year and a half, two shelters. Um, one is in Queens and one is in Manhattan. Our diabetes programming is very holistic. So we really look at it as a three-legged stool. And without any of the legs, the stool will topple over. So if we're thinking about the pieces of our diabetes programming, we have nutrition, we have fitness, and we have health education. Within our buildings, we have a number of services um, in addition to basic case management and social work. We have the Department of Health and Wellness, which I am the director of. We have nutrition, culinary arts, and horticulture, and we'll talk a little bit about that. We have um, education and employment, and we have arts and culture. Um, 
In terms of diabetes, we're going to be looking at the health education, fitness, and nutrition. Um, in terms of health and the health and wellness programs, we have um, we do groups. Um, in light of COVID, we attempted to do virtual groups that were not very effective. One of the limitations that we found within our population is that a lot of people have data plans on their phones, so they have limited data and they are very protective of their data. So um, it is difficult to do virtual groups since COVID. We have progressed to now we are doing groups again with a limit of four people per group, um, everybody wearing masks, six feet of distance between people, um, space permitting. Um, some of our spaces are a little bit smaller than others, so we wouldn't have necessarily four people. And everything sanitized before or after, hand sanitizer used before and after. So we have protocols in place. We do a lot of tabling. Um, you can see in our slide this example of some of our tabling. Um, we've had health fairs. We do a lot of outreach and one-on-one -on -one education. We do check in on our fragile clients, um, clients with more serious health conditions. Um, and in terms of diabetes-specific programming, we have worked directly with local community-based organizations who've been funded to do uh, diabetes self-management programs. And self-management edu education programs have been shown to be very effective to lower A1C levels, prevent or reduce diabetes complications, improve quality of life, and lower medical expenses. So we do run groups. Um, we were very lucky to partner with an organization in the Bronx called Health People. They not only ran these groups, they ran the groups with peer facilitators. So um, the facilitators also were people who were dealing with diabetes and they supplied what is our biggest attraction to having people come to groups, which is healthy food. Um, and the groups would run covering topics such as diabetes, diabetes treatment, healthy eating, physical activity, taking your medications, how to check your blood pressure, a blood sugar, pardon me, blood sugar, reducing risk for other health problems and learning to cope with stress, depression, and other concerns. They're small group workshops, they're two and a half hours per session. This is an evidence-based intervention. So this is not a community-based organization that put together a diabetes program. They were trained as experts, their peers were trained, and they go into the community and provide these um, programs at, normally at community based other community based organizations, we partnered with them as a housing program. It's one session a week for six weeks. Um, and they're very effective because not only do you have the peer facilitators, but everyone is dealing with the same issues and there's mutual support. People build on each other's successes. Um, they plan each week for the next week. So what you see are techniques to deal with the symptoms of diabetes, appropriate exercise, healthy eating, appropriate use of medication, working more effectively with healthcare providers, um, how to advocate for themselves, as well as, as I said, they make weekly action plans, share their experiences, and help each other solve problems they encounter in creating and carrying out the self-management program. So that, in a nutshell, is the health education, which is really more than just information-based, but it's psychoeducational. It addresses some of the behavioral issues that are associated with high risk for diabetes or complications for people who have diabetes. Um, 
Next, we talk about the next leg of our stool, which is our nutrition and our culinary art. Um, and we we do a lot of work with local farmers. Um, everything that we provide through our fresh food box, which comes usually weekly to the buildings, um, is locally sourced. And when it is no longer available in the winter, we do bring up foods from other areas, but they are foods that are available locally. So they may be out of season in New York, but they're in season somewhere else. We normally would set them up like a farmer's market and people could come and choose and pick the vegetables and fruits that they want. They also would get fresh eggs. Um, since COVID, what we've been doing is pre-packaging. People can put in an order for what they want and we will pre-package the food for them and deliver it to their homes or they come and pick it up. Always with the masks and the six feet and different things. Um, we also do culinary education because some of the vegetables people are completely unfamiliar with. One of the ones we came across was eggplant. People weren't sure how to cook it or what to do with it. So we provide culinary education um, and basically use the food that comes with the fresh food box to prepare the meal so people can learn how to use the vegetables and fruits that they're getting each week. Um, since COVID, we've also added, not only do we give out recipes for people to use with the fresh food box packages that we now pre-prepare, but we have videos of cooking classes. So this is a, a still from one of our cooking classes, making some delicious tostones. And um, those are sent out every week and people can access them through their case managers and through their so social workers um, and learn how to prepare some of the foods in, in the, the fresh food box. We also have a lot of horticulture and in 11 of our 16 buildings, we have space at least for some gardening and the gardening is all fruits and vegetables. Um, people take responsibility. It, it increases access to healthy food as well as gardening has been shown to reduce stress and improve mental health. So. Um, there are groups of people in in these buildings that get very passionate about their their garden and their harvesting. So this is always available to the tenants in our buildings as well. Um, and lastly, we have a meal service. Normally, um, we have the meal service, I believe, in seven of our buildings and what we've been doing since COVID, again, is it comes pre-plated and packaged and people pick it up and take it back to their apartments or their rooms. Um, we miss the days when we could all get together and share a meal, but hopefully those days will be coming soon. Um, and then fitness, the third leg of our stool. We have an exercise consultant who goes into five of our buildings. Um, and that's chosen, that's primarily due to which buildings have the funding. He does classes. He does also individual personal training with anyone who's interested while he's there. We have fully equipped gyms in four of our buildings, and you'll see that in some of my next slides. We have equipment in another three buildings, things like resistance bands, uh, medical balls, weights. Um, we do these wellness challenges in spring into spring, which are always fun because they become comp competitions and uh, people are charged with their different tasks each, each week, like exercising three times a week or preparing a meal with 
something from the fresh food box. And the more things that they complete, usually a wellness challenge will run about four to six weeks. The more that they complete, they'll get a ticket toward a raffle. And at the end of the wellness challenge, we'll raffle off something to the people who completed the most of the tasks in the wellness challenge. And the interesting part of it is the tenants really like it that the staff actually does it with them. So it's, um, it really builds community while promoting this healthy activity. We've brought in other community-based organizations who've done trauma-informed yoga with our tenants. We have walking clubs in some of our buildings and during the summer and fall, um, the walking clubs will go to the farmer's market and make use of New York City's health box, um, which provides people with coupons that double. If they spend $1, it's worth two, um, and they can get fresh food and vegetables at the farmer's market. And we do meditation as well. Um, so to get a chance to see some of this, these are some of our fitness centers. We don't always have the balloons there. That was a celebration of our, our, our grand opening of that fitness center. But we have things like treadmills and bicycles, and I believe we may have, well, we have weights. I can, we have, I think we may even have um, the step masters. I don't know what are those called. We have classes as well. You can see some yoga, some calisthenics, stretching, um, and then meditation. I, now, since COVID, just as we've been doing the short videos on cooking preparation um, with the Fresh Food Box, we've been doing fitness videos. And this is a, an example of one of our meditation videos. Um, our consultant will do 10 minute videos that we send out on a weekly basis and are shared with our tenants. He works with whatever is there, just like, um, Ms. Arevalo was speaking about. You don't have to have exercise equipment. This is an exercise he's doing with a broom. Um, he'll do exercises with water bottles, but He's always looking for ways people can exercise from their homes because, unfortunately, with COVID, we've had to close our exercise centers um, and halt our in-person classes because due to the multiple health conditions that our tenants come with, it is not necessarily the safest thing for us, for them to be doing exercise with masks on where heavy breathing may be a result. So we're offering the alternative of being able to exercise from their rooms with the exercise videos. And we send, send out with the fresh food box bags, all the pre-prepared bags, we send out those recipes that I mentioned, and we send out workout handouts. And this is, again, our consultant. He puts these together, and each week we send out a workout handout or two that people can do from their home. So that, in a nutshell, is Lantern and our diabetes programming. And thank you very much for your attention. And we will answer questions after everyone speaks. Thanks so much, Carol. Um, so we're going to hop from New York to Chicago now and hear from Leone about um, Muevete. Hi. Oh, is this me? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Leone Calderon. I I work with the Puerto Rican Culture Center. The Puerto Rican Culture Center um, is a community-based organization that has had um, over 45 years in the community providing health, education, and cultural services and events. 
Um, and I today I'm going to speak um, about Muevete, more kind of um, the experience that I've had, had with um, the Muevete program. So the Muevete program um, what started as a response to my personal health struggle. Um, I am an obese woman and I've been obese all my life. Um, and when I started back uh, Muevete back 15 years ago, uh, um, it was kind of to make to kind of make sure that I do not follow in my mother's footsteps and my grandma's footsteps. My mother took um, medication all her life for high blood pressure, and I mentioned I, I heard Sandra mention uh, about high high blood pressure and and um, diabetes as well. And my grandma died at 53 um, of diabetes. So there's been a so these health health there's health issues. Um, that I already see in my family. So when I went to the doctor, I, at the time I was over 300 pounds and I had all kinds of health issues, high cholesterol, high, um, I was borderline diabetes or diabetic. Um, my, the doctor had started me with high blood pressure medication, water pills at the time, and my joints were hurting all the time uh, simply by walking um, a, a block or so. And at the time, like I said, this is going to be more on a personal level that I'm going to um, talk about my experiences. I lost my period for over a year. Um, and all these health issues um, obviously were, were weighing on me um, in terms of my health, and I want to live like that. So what I did, um, I started walking the park because um, I did not want to take medication um, for the rest of my life, and I just I, I refuse to take medication because um, medication. The problem with the medication, obviously, is you take medication, but then um, you get side effects from the medication. So then you're taking other medications to um, to cover those side effects. So I wanted to get to the root of the problem. So I started walking, um, and from walking, that's how Muevete this started. And Muevete, I'm sure people know what Muevete stands for, but the, the, it translates literally to move. Um, and the slogan "Move for Life" because um, we need to move in order for we need to move um, to get our bodies in motion, but also we need to do it for the rest of our life. Um, and I also mentioned Carol um, talking about um, people not feeling comfortable doing um, physical activity outside. That was me, and that's still me. Um, even though I'm more. Um, I do more now than I used to do before. Um, and I, I joined all kinds of health clubs, Women Workout World, Bally at the time, I'm, I'm dating myself, I'm sure. Um, Curves at the time. Um, I joined all these, health, um, all these health fitness programs, but they were not, um, how can I say, they were not meant for me, which was kind of weird since I am fat, a fat woman and I need to be at a health club, but yet everybody around me especially the people that work there and the people that are there, um, they would give me a um, disgusting look because of my size, because I'm an obese woman. And so that made me feel ashamed of even being in a health club. So I just did it. I did, I did my own thing. So what I did, um, I started walking the park, the humble park here uh, in Chicago, and I invited women to come and join me. Um, and then that led to, um, so the group started getting growing, um, and then it was close to, um, to the fall, so it got really, really cold. So with a direct, direct um, collaboration with the Puerto Rican Culture Center, which is the organization that I work for now, and um, the Chicago Park District, with those two um, collaborators, I was able to take Muevete inside um, the park. And the first slide there, you see... Um, I remember um, Humble Park told me that if I can, if I can guarantee 15 people that I can have the space for free, it took me three weeks to um, it took me three weeks to get 15 people together, and then it just grew. I went from the smallest room at the Humble Park Field House um, to the basement um, um, play area to the second to the second floor um, gym. I've been all over the Humble Park Field House um, um, with my group, and, and I, I, pre-COVID, I held the, um, the largest gym at the Humble Park Field House. Um, 
So, um, so we took it inside from the walking group. It turned into a dance aerobic class because obviously there's so much walking and running that you can do in a gym. Um, and then, um, so in 2005, Wemmick was established as a community-based program for um, um, with a direct collaboration of the Puerto Rican Culture Center and the Chicago Park District, and this allowed um, for the community to come out. Um, in 2008, we extended from Humboldt Park to Casiasco Park because the group was getting too big to um, to hold in just one area. Um, so then we had a second class at the Casiasco Park. Um, then in 2010, um, the Puerto Rican Culture Center um, started working directly with um, with like, the Humboldt Park. I'm sorry, with the Greater Humboldt Park Diabetes Empowerment Center. Um, and they hired me to extend more of it at the Diabetes Empowerment Center because obviously um, they were doing diabetes prevention and management and control, but they needed the physical activity portion to combine um, to have a holistic um, form of, of, of prevention and management. And um, in 2010, by, uh, by 2010, I started extending the program from, from walking in the park and dance aerobic at the, at the, home, at the Chicago Park District to, um, I added Zumba, I added yoga, I added Tai Chi, I added Pilates and biking. Um, and these were collaborations that um, we've, we've done or I've done um, through networking with the community. Um, for example, um, all of my instructors, they're all volunteers. Um, in fact, Muevete has been in existence for 15 years, and only six years out of the 15 years um, did we have funding to provide um, stipends to the, to the instructors. The rest, they start just like I started. I started just as I started on my own and became a volunteer instructor. Um, obviously, I'm the creator. <laughs> um, and from there, um, I became a facilitator of dance aerobics. And usually how I get my instructors is that they become participants first. Once they become participants, um, I, um, I kind of usher them into, into in, instructing if, they, you know, if this is something that they're interested in. So I kind of nurse that interest by, by them becoming instructors, and those that show interest in, in becoming instructors, then, um, then they, they become volunteers with the program. Um, and the program is a community-based um, program, so we, are, we have been able to have it a free service for the community due primarily through the, through the collaboration with the Puerto Rican Culture Center and the Puerto Rican Culture Center and the Chicago Park District. Um, in 2011, I established the Move for Life. Move for Life basically um, is a season kickoff event that I started at the Humboldt Park here. Um, the idea behind uh, Move for Life is to get people out and moving um, early in the spring so that they can get um, used to the idea of being physical. Because Muevete is not just about dance aerobic or, or walking. Muevete is about movement, any kind of movement that will promote physical activity. Um, and um, one of the one of the panelists mentioned it earlier. Um, cleaning, walking, um, take, um, dancing with your children, um, anything can become physical activity. Physical activity, um, going up and down the stairs. And I we always I want to we encourage people to be in movement, regardless whether they do it with Muevete or they do it on their own or they do it with other people. Because the idea is to stay active. Because the more you move, obviously. Uh, the more your, your body wants to move. Um, in 2012, um, Muevete, because the influx of, of volunteer instructor was so high, Muevete established um, training, one, um, um, Muevete 101, which, which is basically for people who show interest in volunteering, but they've never um, facilitated a group, um, a group and so um, Muerte 101 talks about um, the history of Muerte and how, and how to, to facilitate a group. And then train the trainer, I, I would get a lot of um, people who were professional. For example, my yoga instructor, well, my, all of my yoga instructors, um, I've never had to train them because they already become trained. Um, so with them, I don't, I don't, you know, they don't have to be participants. They can just uh, um, join us. Um, 
So for them, we have trained their trainers so that we um, so to give them an orientation of how it works. Um, the same thing with my Tai Chi instructor. I've had my Tai Chi instructor for 15 years, um, and again, he did, you know he's a, he's he's a professional in his field. He doesn't need to be um, the a participant in order to become a, a volunteer instructor. Um, then. Um, in 2015, Wemeka celebrated its 10th anniversary, and we celebrated with a community walk. Um, the Humble Park here, the park here, um, the Fiesta, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> the Paseo Boricua is at, and the, the Puerto Rican Culture Center is at, um, the Humble Park is the closest park here, and it's one of the biggest parks in Chicago. So going around the park two and a half times, you complete um, five miles, which, which is um, about 10,000 steps. So we did 10,000 steps community walk to celebrate 10, um, 10, the 10th anniversary of what I think. Um, and that was, uh, and we, again, we did networking and, and collaboration with um, other organizations and institutes in the community. Um, and then 2020, um, this year we celebrated our, or we're celebrating our 15th anniversary. Um, currently, well, pre-COVID, Muevete um, has three locations where we do physical activity. We have the Diabetes Empowerment Center, where we do most of our physical activity. We have two parks in the, in the Chicago Park District. We have Humboldt Park and Casiasco Park. Um, and we have over, I have over 15 volunteer instructors. Um, we've had in, in 15 years, I've had over 35 physical activity instructors. My core group is about um, 10 instructors. And I have five instructors that come and go. Um, and let's see, did I miss anything about about Muevete? So Muevete again, um, back to um, physical activity and Muevete. Muevete, it was all about uh, myself having um, health issues and wanting to correct that without having to take pills, without having to have um, gastric bypass, without having to um, to to spend money on health. Loans. Um, the idea was to be able to be physically active, feel comfortable in my own skin as an obese woman, because even though I've lost like 80 pounds doing physical activity, I'm still considered an obese woman, but I am I no longer have the um, the health issues that an obese woman or an obese person would have due to their health. Um, and and you know, and, and like I said, Muevete is all about physical activity, all about movement. And movement can be done anywhere you're at. I started walking the park. Um, we've done it in the in Humble Park Field House. We've done it outside of the Humble Park Field House. Um, we use the park. We use obviously we use our um, our built-in um, um, environment. We use our built-in environment to utilize it for physical activity. So you could do, you know, people can do stuff at home. Use their stairs. Do chores. Uh, you can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, and and um, like I mentioned, before, one of the panelists mentioned, before, you don't have to have weights. You know, you can use household items as as your weight um, um, in order to do physical activity. Um, <clears throat> so to wrap this up, <laughs> the um, the idea behind Muevete is to stay active at all at at all, at all points, whether or not you have money, you can still be active. It doesn't take money and it doesn't take um, equipment. It just takes a little bit of time um, to do the physical activity. And of course, if, you, if a person wants to have uh, a program like Muevete, it, um, it's very important to do collaborations with your, your local um, partners, um, stakeholders in the community. And because physical activity and nutrition both are the are the, the cornerstone of health, whether the person has diabetes, high blood pressure, um, insomnia, um, any kind of health problems, nutrition and, and physical activity um, are pretty much the, um, the recipe for managing whatever health issues the person may have. Um, it's almost essential to have physical activity in, in a person's life. Um, Post-COVID, um, because um, the Chicago Park District is not opening the um, the the space for for groups, we no longer have um, physical activity 
we no longer have physical activity in the in the parks and the physical activities that used to take place in the empowerment center um, are on hold until further until we start to reopen um, um, the city again. But currently, post COVID, we have um, virtual physical activity um, for pre-registered participants. Um, hey, and so that's how we are dealing. That's how we're dealing with with, with COVID. Thank you, Jeff. I'm sorry to I'm sorry to cut you short, Leone. We're, okay. we're at the top of the hour. I'm so sorry. This is all such great information. Um, I really appreciate all of our guest speakers joining us today. Um, we don't have time, unfortunately, for Q and A, but all of our guest speakers are obviously some great resources from various different perspectives. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, and I can I can um, relay those questions. So you have a um, evaluation popped up on the screen right now, and you'll have about a minute to fill that out. And as you do, I'm going to highlight a couple of upcoming opportunities. If you have to hop off, I totally understand. Sorry that we've run a little bit over time here. But um, first, we have uh, CSH has um, health and housing focus groups that are available to you um, to participate in. And I'm going to enter the registration for those in the chat. But these are five focus groups that are held to um, hopefully promote understanding of the content for easy and effective learning and the best way that we can develop resources. So I'm going to put that in the chat. And finally, I also will put in the chat um, registration for our upcoming learning collaborative that I mentioned at the top of the hour. Um, let's see if I can enter that into the chat right now. There it is. So please feel free to check out both of those links and um, really participate in continuing learning around diabetes prevention and, and around health and housing partnerships. Um, so hopefully you all had enough time to fill out that evaluation, but I'm so thankful to um, especially our guest speakers today for joining us in a, a really busy month and a challenging year or so. We appreciate you so much. Um, and thank you to you all for joining us and listening in today. Um, please stay in touch, uh, stay connected, and continue learning. Thanks to everyone and have a great afternoon.